Hello everybody and welcome back to the Emerson Swan Mobile Training Center. I'm Kevin Shea, technical trainer for Emerson Swan. Today we're going to continue in our technical training series on the HTP Ariston Elite Ultra Boiler, the newest boiler from HTP uh, featuring the Extra Tech heat exchanger. Uh, today we're going to be going over startup of the boiler as prescribed through the manufacturer's installation manual. Uh, I will be following the procedures as prescribed by the manual on page 75. If you'd like to follow along, that would be great. Before we go any further, um, I'd like to show you, this is a trim package that comes with the boiler. Um, it's actually packaged uh, right behind the boiler when you uh, uncrate the boiler. Uh, you'll find this and inside you'll find the uh, boiler manifold, piping, the unit strut to mount it to the wall, uh, a bunch of different parts, the, the uh, nipple for the uh, vent pipe, etc. But what I'm interested in at the moment is the field conversion. So we talk about uh, the setting up of the burner with the CO and CO2 adjustments on the gas valve. Well, if you have to perform a field conversion, in other words, if the, the boiler would be configured for natural gas and we're going to convert it to propane, uh, the trim package comes with the appropriate parts for the field conversion. This is the Polyduro Venturi, which is for the LP conversion. Um, it shows on the black tag here, gas type LPG, to confirm this is the proper. Venturi. The natural gas to propane conversion instructions are actually in the document package. I've already removed that to show them to you. And um, you also have a, a sticker which would be applied to the side of the boiler after the conversion for documentation. You have the required gaskets for the gas line coming into the Venturi. When we do a conversion, we want to replace and use the gaskets that come with the kit. And then, of course, the, the LP diaphragm, which will be inserted into the, the Venturi itself. So let me push these aside, and I'll actually open up a boiler and pull off the existing natural gas Venturi and perform a conversion. We're going to go ahead and open up the boiler and access the parts. Again, fold down the uh, display and expose the internal parts of the boiler and we will start to disassemble the parts required. Now this boiler, of course, when they come from the factory, it, it came through uh, 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 pre-adjusted and set up with a natural gas venturi and that's what we're going to change out for the conversion. So, let's take our field wiring box off and then we have our silencer. Let's remove that. Junction box mount. Remove that. Now we can see the polyduro venturi, which is the part we're removing. This is set up for natural gas. We'll be removing that and installing our uh, Polydoro Venturi designed for LP. So first thing we're going to do is, and pardon me, I'm going to have to probably block your view a little bit. We'll get in here and remove the gas pipe. And remember we're going to use the gaskets that came with the kit so we can place aside the original. The next thing we will take a 10 millimeter socket or nut driver and remove. There are three fasteners on the Venturi. Three. With the third fastener removed, we can see the natural gas polyduro venturi with the 
natural gas diaphragm inserted into it and we will be making this conversion. We do want to make note that the recessed o-ring is in good condition and properly inserted for a good seal. We go ahead and place the LP diaphragm into the Venturi. Make sure our mating surfaces are nice and clear. It's brand new, so it looks to be in really good shape. We'll go ahead and put our fasteners on. Last but not least, using the gaskets that came with the conversion kit. Fasten up our fittings and then go ahead and we'll put our parts back together. That clips in, put our silencer in. field wiring connection box will route our wires and we just converted the Venturi's for our natural gas to propane conversion and at this point of course we would enter into our combustion analysis and gas valve adjustment okay to this point we've filled our system we've flushed and purged it and we're going to power up the boiler for the first time. Prior to powering up the boiler, we just want to make a couple of quick checks. We want to confirm that we have at least 12 PSI in our system, matching the pressure that is set in your expansion tank. The other thing that we want to be sure of is the air vent that is uh, located on top of the pump is in the open position. When we engage the power for the first time, the system is going to go into a six minute purge cycle. During this purge cycle, we want to make sure that the air vent on the pump is open and that we have access to our manual purge vent located at the top of the boiler. To access, we're going to pull the cover off. There's two screws, Phillips head screws at the bottom of the jacket. I've already previously removed them. Just pull out on the bottom of the jacket and lift straight up. The cover will easily be removed where we can start to see the extra tech heat exchanger and the internal parts but at this point here is the manual purge valve. While we're in that six minute purge cycle we can go ahead and open that up and any foamy water any air that's left in there is going to drain directly into the condensate drain. So a couple of things let's show you where the air vent is on the pump that I'm referring to it's located right on top of the pump you're gonna to have to kind of reach around the condensate and there's a, a, a bright red cap it's the only bright red cap back there and we're just gonna loosen that lefty loosey we know we don't have to remove it just loosen it up so we've confirmed that we have our 12 PSI We've confirmed that our vent, uh, automatic vent, is in the open position and we have access to our, our, our manual purge valve. At this point, we can go ahead and give it power. Okay, to this point, just a quick review. We've filled, flushed and purged the system. We have reached in and opened up the air vent that's located on the pump, the red cap. We've confirmed that we have pressure in the system and we powered up. The initial powering will engage the six minute post purge, uh, purge cycle. Sorry. 
Upon the initial firing of the burner, there will be a six minute air purge cycle. Once that six minutes has expired and the burner is ran for one hour or has been powered up for one hour, the algorithm will then be ignored in the control. That will be the only time it goes through that six minute purge. If you have to replace a control in the future, of course, it's a brand new control, it would go through that six minute purge cycle again. In the startup procedure, one of the first things that we always want to make sure of is venting. The vent is nothing less than the single most important safety device on the system. We have to confirm that the vent has been installed properly, has been supported properly, a pitched quarter of an inch foot back to the boiler, that the terminations uh, are uh, installed appropriately to codes, uh, and, and that all of the fittings have been properly glued and secured. Once we've confirmed that, we can start into our sequence. The first thing we're going to want to do is to close off our gas valve. The next step, we're going to test the lockout feature of the control. We're going to fire it with the gas valve in the off position. The way we're going to fire it is to put it into our test mode. And our test mode is holding the reset button down for approximately 10 seconds. You'll note you're in test mode as indicated by the word test written across the display. And the burner will go through its ignition attempts. It'll attempt to ignite that flame three times before it goes into a 501 lockout code. The burner has attempted to ignite the flame with the gas valve off. We have successfully incurred a 501 safety lockout. That's a no ignition lockout. Very important that we conduct that test. Now, of course, we can reset it, uh, open up our gas valve, and prepare for the combustion analysis. The combustion analysis, of course, is going to start with the most fundamental reading of all, our inlet gas pressure. Prior to engaging our startup and combustion analysis, I've gathered a couple of tools uh, to make it convenient so I'm not looking for it during these test cycles. These condensing boilers, they do come up the temperature very quickly, so you want to be prepared. A couple of tools that you're going to need. Uh, some, some Torx bits. I have a, a 10, a 20, and a 40. I also have a number 4 Allen. That's all you're going to need to make your gas valve adjustments. A couple of other tools we're going to need. Digital manometer and our combustion analyzer. We're all ready to rock and roll. First thing I'm going to do is access the gas valve by opening up the access panel. Simply pull in the tabs and lower the panel and we have access to our Honeywell gas valve. At this point we're going to start our combustion tests. The first thing we're going to do is check our inlet gas pressure. To do this we'll use our number 10 Torx and we're going to open up the inlet pressure manifold tap simply by Loosening it up, we're not going to remove it. Just loosen it up. Turn on your manometer, make sure she's zeroed out. Once she's zeroed out, we can place the manometer tube directly over the test port and open our gas valve. Okay, we'll be checking our inlet pressures. This trailer is operating on propane. Our inlet pressures will be, between, will be between 8 and 13 inches of water column. If we were firing natural gas, the inlet pressures would be between 3.5 and 10.5. So we're, we're plugged in, we have our gas valve open, and we're looking at our inlet pressure. Our inlet pressure is showing 11.43 inches of water column definitely between the rated values. So far so good. The next thing we'll do is fire the burner and observe the pressure drop on the digital manometer. Reset it from our 501 code 
and we will go into our test mode. And upon ignition, we'll observe the pressure drop on the digital manometer. If you observe in people, you notice that my trailer went over an inch of pressure drop. That's because of the modifications that we have to make to the trailer for transportation purposes, for the fact that we're powering up several boilers. Uh, you should not experience that on your job site. However, if you do experience larger than an inch of pressure drop, then by all means you'll have to stop the test at that point and, uh, uh, and figure out what's wrong with the gas supply. Now that we've finished the inlet pressure check and pressure drop, we're going to go ahead and remove the digital manometer and secure that test port. Of course, I always shut off the gas valve anytime that I have any parts from the gas train opened up to atmosphere. Go back into the test port and just snug that right back up. Okay, in the name of safety, before we proceed with an, a live flame, we're going to make sure that we don't have any leaks uh, where we just opened things up in here. We're going to put a little squirt on a couple of the fittings, make sure that we don't have any gas leaks. You can use your nose, obviously, the soap bubble test, but make sure that we checked any of the fittings, especially the ones that you just opened and closed. Um, and as long as we don't have any leaks, I don't have any odors, I think we'll be ready to proceed. The next thing we'll be doing is the combustion analysis and we'll be making the first adjustment in max fire. To get there we have to do a couple of preparations. Turn on the analyzer, make sure that it goes through its calibration process, prepare uh, for the test. Uh, in preparation for the test, one of the things we'll do is open up the test port which is prefabricated uh, for your convenience. You have uh, an exhaust and an air intake. So to open up the test port, I'm going to use my number 20 Torx bit. Put it right up here in the screw, open it up. The test port is secured by a couple of, uh, sealed I should say, by a couple of O-rings. And we pull that out and uh, there's our access for our combustion analysis. Uh, grabbing a little probe adapter, I'm going to put the left port is the test port for the exhaust. And typically I want to be in the center of the vent pipe. So it's about a three inch factory pipe. I bottom it out, pull it out about an inch and a half and I'm approximately in the center of the vent pipe for a more accurate uh, gas temperature sample. So we're going to go ahead and uh, prepare to make our gas valve adjustment. When we are in max fire we're going to adjust the throttle valve which I'm going to use my four millimeter Allen wrench and that will be placed right in in preparation to make an adjustment should we have to. For proper combustion analysis we will have to take our readings with the cabinet closed. Okay now we're going to engage test mode. Um, before we engage test mode, uh, I just want to uh, mention that you should probably have the thermostat or, or maybe a couple of thermostats turned up to be able to uh, relieve the boiler of its BTU load or run some domestic hot water. Um, but now we're going to engage the uh, test mode. We'll power up the boiler and uh, hit the reset button and hold it, uh, depress the button down for approximately 10 seconds and when it goes into test mode the display will actually read test. So now we're into test mode. While in test mode the boiler allows you to uh, change the fan speeds, the burner speed from high fire to low fire 
as indicated by the icons at the bottom of the display. So currently we've ignited the boiler and by indication of the radiator that would tell us we're in central heat high fire. The display also shows a flame uh, which proves that we have ignition. So we are in high fire. Now before we start to take the test I just want to walk through the display just a little bit. Again by the bracketed uh, uh, service wrench, the plus and minus buttons, we can move the fan speed, thus the high fire, low fire. So if we press plus, you'll notice the icon went from the radiator now to a faucet. The faucet indicates high fire for domestic hot water. If we go down two steps, so one step would be high fire for central heat, again as indicated by the radiator. We press the minus again, and that puts us into low fire as indicated by both the radiator and the faucet. The manual asks us to start our combustion analysis, our tests, on high fire. So on high fire, we'll go ahead and press the plus button. Central heat, high fire. Now you can look in the manual at the gas table. will indicate which or if both central heat or domestic hot water have 100% speed to it. Uh, the one that has 100% is the one you want to choose to make sure that you're confirming CO and CO2 on high fire. So in this case it would be our radiator for central heat and uh, that puts us in high fire and now we want to check our CO and CO2 on our combustion analyzer. In the manual it tells us our adjustments of CO2 are between 9.5 and 10.5 on high fire and low fire. Our CO has to be equal to or less than 175 parts per million. So currently we're showing on high fire 10.3 percent CO2 which is between the 9.5 and 10.5 allowed. If I were in the field and this was a commissioning, I do not need to make a gas valve adjustment on my high fire at this point because we're already adjusted and quite often that's what you're going to find when you commission the boiler that um, quite often the gas valve adjustment quote unquote is more of a confirmation process to make sure the CO, CO2 values are proper. Um, it, it, in concerning uh, LP conversions from natural gas to LP, well there will definitely be a CO and CO2 adjustment uh, required or definitely has to be checked and confirmed. Uh, now on high fire, if we were to have to make an adjustment, uh, we would of course open the cabinet to expose the gas valve, fold the display forward. The high fire adjustment is made by a throttle valve which is to the right of the offset adjustment with the, the Allen wrenches installed into it. So the throttle valve and the offset are directly proportional in regards that if you turn either one in the clockwise direction CO and CO2 will increase. If you adjust the offset and the throttle valve and or the throttle valve counterclockwise, you will reduce CO and CO2. So perhaps we want to attempt reducing the CO2 uh, down from 10.3 to 10.2. And what we would do is, again, clockwise increases, counterclockwise decreases. So we will take the throttle valve and the throttle valve is graduated and you can feel the clicks as you make the adjustment. So you can count the clicks and note the orientation of your, your tool that you're using. In this case I'll go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 clicks which is about half a turn. We need to button up the cabinet. Let's back this down a little bit more. Make about another eight clicks. We'll close it up. Oh, 
Well, that would be about right. We didn't do a full turn, and a full turn would typically be approximately 0.3% difference of CO2. And we went about probably 75 to 80% of a turn, which brought us down to 10.1. So at this point, we're still between our 9.5 and our 10.5. So we can take our next step and move the burner down into low fire. Again, going to the bracketed service wrench, we can hit the minus button where we see the uh, radiator and the faucet, which indicates we're on low fire. And again, we want to be between 9.5 and 10.5. We, we're burning LP and we need to be equal to or less than 175 parts per million on our CO. Okay, the value is holding at 10.1, so it did not go above the high fire of CO2, which is critical. We do not want our low fire CO2 to be higher than our high fire. And we don't want it to be any greater than 0.3% CO2 less than our high fire. And we went from 10.1, we're now steady at 10.0, which is within our 0.3%. And we can go down to our CO, and on low fire, it looks like we're holding at around 6 ppm, which is definitely below 175 parts per million. So technically, again, if we were in the field, we've confirmed low and high fire, um, we would be good. However, if I wanted to make a low fire adjustment, uh, the way we would adjust that is with the offset. And the offset is certainly a lot more sensitive than the throttle valve adjustment. So when, when, when adjusting the offset, uh, be very patient, make very small incremental changes. And again, wait that minute or so for your analyzer to properly display the new uh, flue gas. Uh, sample values. So again we open up the cabinet. To make a low fire adjustment we will adjust by the offset adjustment which is covered by a cap so we use our T40 Torx and take the cap off the adjustment. Same T40 at this point and again if we adjust Clockwise, we will increase CO and CO2. If we adjust counterclockwise, we will decrease CO and CO2. And I will decrease my CO2 by turning counterclockwise. And again, we're just going to make a very small adjustment. We will close up the cabinet. and wait for our analyzer to display exactly what we did. And with that tiniest, not even a quarter of a turn, we dropped it from 10-0, 10-1, all the way down to 9-4. So that adjustment is, is, uh, is quite sensitive. So we want to make sure that when we're moving that offset, we're moving it uh, in very very short little incremental adjustments so I'm going to try to get this back to my 10 0 10 1 safely back to 10 0 that adjustment uh, just took a couple of minutes for it to uh, to stabilize. I, I might have overshot a tiny bit. I'm at 9.9 .9. but as you can see the uh, uh, the relationship between the adjustments the entire process uh, start from start to finish literally should take no more than approximately 10 minutes. 
Um, now, again, that's 10 minutes. Uh, I would say that would be worst case scenario. You did a natural to LP conversion and you had to make a slight gas valve adjustment. But quite often this process is more of a confirmation process as much as a, 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 it, it would have been an adjustment process. So um, again, the throttle valve, not as sensitive, but we still want to uh, be patient with our adjustments and allow the time for our analyzer to uh, display the proper values. And when adjusting in low fire with the offset, the offset is significantly more sensitive and we want to be very patient and make very small incremental adjustments. Again, wait for the analyzer to display its proper values. So uh, to get out of test mode, if we're, we're satisfied with our readings and our adjustments, uh, one or two things. We can uh, hit the reset button again and that will cancel it out immediately. Or if by chance you forgot that you were in test mode, after 30 minutes the boiler will automatically revert back into its run mode. So we will press the test button and get out of our test mode. And that was a successful gas valve adjustment. Up to this point, the installation has gone great. We've done our purging, we've set it up, we've done our combustion analysis. Now we just have to make sure that the control parameters are set appropriately. The parameters, of course, will be dictated by your system. Do you have a high temp system, a low temp system? Uh, is it making domestic hot water, not making domestic hot water? There's a couple of ways we can access the control. We're going to start with the most basic, the quick access. This is going to address the most fundamental and basic settings that need to be checked and or adjusted for your particular system. If you would be so kind to follow along in the install manual, I'm on page 64 where we're going to review the access codes in this ladder diagram and uh, talk about the, there's a couple of different ways we can access these codes. The first way we're going to access is our quick access and address the most basic and fundamental settings high temp, low temp, uh, set point operation, etc, etc, domestic hot water. Um, as you follow along on page uh, 64 again, we're going to enter into this access uh, menu by simultaneously pressing the plus and minus button here again on the service side indicated by the wrench service side of the display and we hold these buttons down again for about five seconds and what that did is pull us into our access menu first one being PCB okay first menu item is the PCB this is access to the motherboard uh, typically we'll access that if we have to do a control replacement in the future or access for future upgrades for the existing software. The next item by hitting the plus button will scroll to the next menu item and in this case it shows ERR error. This will be access to the error codes. Uh, this will give you access to the last 10 fault codes in the future when you're doing uh, maintenance. As we continue through, the next item that shows up is menu. When we go through the actual menu, that will give us full access to every single function that the boiler has to offer and we can go in there individually uh, to every, every function. Okay, the next men menu item is DHW which will give you quick access to the two most fundamental domestic hot water settings. Of course, we're going to revisit these. I'm just introducing you to the items. The next one will be central heat one. This is your zone one, uh, the, the four most basic functions, set point, uh, operation, max and minimum temperatures. So uh, this particular guide uh, is the quick access, of course. So in, in this case, we're, we're already here. We're at central heat one. That will be one of the first things that we'll have to check. So knowing that we're going to enter into the central heat one, we can look over here on our diagram on 64, and it tells us that we'll access codes 402, 420, 425, and 426. Now what I suggest is that we turn the page on the install manual and you can see the numbers on the left side of the descriptions that will actually 
tie you directly to the functions that we're working on. So in this particular case, we're in central heat one. We say OK, and that brings us to first menu item of 420, uh, 402. So we look at function 402 in the manual. Again, I'm on page 67, and it says zone one fixed temperature. Now this fixed temperature is based on the next parameter that we'll look at actually 420. So what it's, what it's uh, saying is whether we're on a high temperature or a low temperature default. So we can advance over to 420, hit OK, and just double check that we are on parameter 1. So we look at 420 and uh, the default setting 1, saying that we on our, we, we're on a high temperature system. High temperature range from 95 to 179. The control has the ability to automatically adjust high and low set points at this point by determining, uh, uh, you determine whether you're, you're working with a high temperature or a low temperature system. If you want to change that value uh, uh, to zero, you hit the minus button, it goes to zero, and what we've told the control now is we're in a low temperature application, uh, radiant or, 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 or any low temp app, and the range automatically adjusts uh, between 68 and a max of 113. But for our uh, uh, purposes, we're, we're uh, going to go back to our high temperature application, hit OK, and let's go back to, whoops, sorry, I did that. Let's go back to function 402 where we started. So function 402 says fixed one set point temperature. So in a high temperature application, the high temperature set point is, we hit the OK button and we see the factory default is 179. Now, this setting, if we were to just go on set point operation with no outdoor sensor, this would be the uh, set point limit, the high temperature limit. So if we wanted to change that and uh, maybe we had a cast iron system or something, we want a lower temperature, we can go ahead and lower that by hitting the uh, minus button on the service side here and say we wanted uh, 160 for our high temp and we would hit OK. Uh, so 402, now it will make a, uh, a, a difference if you are using the outdoor sensor in function 402. Um, in function 402, if you're utilizing the outdoor reset strategy and there should be a failure with either the sensor or the wire connecting it, the control will revert back to set point operation. So this function also becomes important if you're utilizing outdoor reset to anticipate a potential failure in the future. We want to make sure that we don't exceed the uh, set point high limit that we have for that particular system. So if we didn't want to exceed 160 degrees um, in this application, we have to make sure that we set that temperature down. I think this will make a little more sense when we look at our next two uh, adjustments, which will be the outdoor temperature adjustments. So just to quickly reiterate, if we're not doing outdoor sensor, uh, outdoor reset strategy, then function 402 is simply the set point uh, of the high limit. So it will modulate up to that point and, and shut down. If you're utilizing the outdoor sensor, then it's going to look at a couple of other functions that we're going to hit in, in one second here. But remember, we have to anticipate a potential failure. If it fails while under the outdoor reset strategy, it will revert back to set point operation. So it becomes imperative that 402 is addressed properly. So we can advance now. We, uh, we looked at function 402. Um, we, we addressed function 420 either being a default high temperature or default low temperature. Um, and then we'll look at the next two, functions 425 and 426. So 425 and 426 uh, will come into play if you are utilizing the outdoor reset strategy. 
So this is where we're going to go ahead and set our maximum and minimum allowable temperatures. Uh, uh, of course, these numbers will be derived uh, again by our system. So 425 will be the zone one heating maximum temperature. So we hit OK and uh, the factory default was 179, so uh, we used 160 for an example. So in this case, we're going to go ahead and adjust back down to that 160 mark. Where we're happy with that number, we hit OK. That takes care of our maximum temperature, and then we go to function 426. 426, when we advance and we hit OK, our factory default is 120 degrees. Now if that 120 degrees is too low for your particular application, maybe this FinTube baseboard, uh, you can tell the boiler at this point what is the lowest temperature I want to allow to be sent out to my emitters, to my baseboard or panel rads. Uh, and, and perhaps maybe 130 is, is, your, is, is the lowest you want to go. So we can go ahead and adjust that and put that up to 130 when we're okay with that. We hit okay. Okay, so we just completed the fourth and final adjustment in central heating through our quick access code. So I'm going to back out of that, get back into our run mode. So there's a back button here on this side uh, with the, uh, the looped arrow. So we're going to go ahead and go back, the central heat one, and we're back into our run mode, if we will. Uh, it's in standby, technically. So now we just went through a quick access for the four basic functions. Now there are several more functions in uh, central heating that can be addressed. Uh, to, to access all of the functions, that we go into the menu. Now, if you remember, again, we're going to access into our quick access codes by pressing simultaneously plus and minus button, as indicated by the service wrench. There's PCB. We're going to forward into our menu. So here we are in our full menu, and I can hit OK. And now what it's going to do is show us a single digit, and that will be the first digit in the access code. Now the last access code that we uh, went into on central heating was code 426. So to show you that we can get into it through the menu and not just through the quick access, I'll show you how to do that. We're going to hit the plus and minus to raise the value to number 4. We're OK. That'll move the digit to the next one where we press 1, 2. There's 4, 2. OK. The third and final, where we go to six, hit OK, and there we are at that low temperature setting on the central heating. So I just wanted to show you that through the menu we have full access. Now, a question that I get occasionally is, hey Kevin, you know, I've, I've, I've gone into the weeds on my menu and, you know, I think I might have made a mistake and I don't really, I, I just want to go back to factory default. And there is a way that we can do that. We can set it back to factory default very easily. Uh, as a matter of fact, I made a nice note down here on my manual. And yes, I use a manual all the time. Factory default reset, function 280. So what we're going to do is go back and we're going to go to 2, so minus, there's our 2, okay. Our next digit will go up to 8, there's our 8, okay. And 0 stays 0, that's our factory reset. We hit okay and now it's going to ask me one last time, do I truly want to reset this all back to factory default? I say, okay, I do. It will confirm that control function with the okay indicated on the display. And we have to give it a minute for it to reset its parameters. And when it redisplays the 280, we're reset right back to our fam uh, factory default. How easy and convenient is that? So let's go back. We're in our run menu. Next we'll take a look at our DHW settings. So we're in DHW where we will hit OK 
And the first function uh, that we can adjust will be function 200. So we can address that again in the manual on page 65. And I look at function 200. Now, this will depend on whether you have a combi or a heating only boiler. Um, in the combi boiler, well, first of all, let's hit OK. And we see what the default is 124. If this were a combi boiler, this is going to be the target output temperature. Simply stated, uh, it, it, that's the temperature that we're going to deliver uh, out of the combi to the faucet. And if we have a heat only boiler, it's, uh, it's, it's, there's a couple of more things that we have to look at uh, to see the relationship between this number and how we're going to manage an indirect tank tied to a heat only boiler. So let's revisit that in one sec. Let's go to the next function. The next function is, we back and go up to function 228. Now, this is where we tell the boiler whether or not the indirect, this is a, oh, for the heating only application, and this is where we tell the boiler if the indirect that's attached to it is equipped with either an aquastat or a sensor. So we hit OK. And in this case, it defaults to number two. So we look at 228, number two. It's a it's storage tank with a thermostat. So that's an aquastat. And when we are tied with an aquastat, this function of 200 becomes a, uh, uh, a set point operation of 179 degrees delivered to the coil. So if, if we just have an aquastat, the tank temperature will be regulated by the aquastat but the delivery temperature going to the coil in the indirect will automatically go up to 179 degrees. Now this changes if we choose to use a sensor. A sensor, instead of just being an open and closed contact, continuously gives a resistance reading to the control, which allows the control to modulate its temperature to, uh, to achieve the set point of the, uh, of the indirect. So if we go to, again, we're in function 228, and if we change that to a number one and hit OK, what we changed that to was storage tank with a sensor. Now, let's go back to that function 200 again. Hit OK. Let's give it one minute. It'll tell us its default setting. The default setting is 124 degrees. So when we're configured with a sensor, the way the control is going to operate, it's going to shoot for 36 degrees higher than this adjusted set point in function 200. So where it's set right now, in other words, for 124, the way it's going to work is the boiler will allow up to 160 degree water to be delivered to the indirect. And it stays uh, uh, directly proportionate. So whatever temperature setting you set in function 200, it will add uh, 36 degrees up to its maximum uh, firing temperature uh, of 179. So, of course, if you uh, exceed 143 degrees, of course, you're not going to get the full 36 degree separation there because the boiler will already be ramped up to 179. So the relationship on function 200 does differ um, depending on whether you're operating the indirect uh, with an aquastat or with a sensor. Just to do a quick recap on those functions with DHW again. Uh, the function 200 was uh, whether or not we're operating a combi boiler or a heat only. If it's a combi boiler, it just becomes simply the output, output temperature. But if it's a heat only boiler, of course, it's going to depend on function 228, where we tell the boiler whether or not the indirect has the sensor or the aquastat. Now, typically, if you're using an aquastat, just leave it at default. When DHW closes, the boiler is going to ramp up to 179 degrees and, and give you the recovery that you need. If you're operating a sensor, 
Well, then there is a relationship between those numbers because of that built-in 36 degree differential. The boiler wants to know how hot you want that uh, uh, delivery water to the indirect. Uh, it, it's all in an effort to maximize our efficiency. Okay, the next thing we're going to look at is outdoor reset. Let's face it, we really need to be engaging our outdoor reset strategies to maximize the fuel economy, the efficiency of the system. It could not be any more simple to do on this boiler. You start by mounting the outdoor sensor. The sensor comes with the boiler. You mount it in the north face of the building out of direct sunlight, out of direct moisture, uh, no more than 150 feet of 18 gauge thermostat wire and tie it to your uh, sensor input on the, uh, on the board. So you tie the outdoor sensor to it and uh, it's as simple as going to your control and simply pressing the auto button. By hitting the auto button, we automatically engage the outdoor reset strategy. There are several pre-programmed factory reset curves. It is defaulted to one of those curves, in this case, as indicated by value 1.3 on our high temperature curve. Now, don't, don't let, get, let, let the, the, the manual get, uh, get you overwhelmed. It's actually very simple. What it is is adaptable. You can choose factory preset curves or you can customize your own curve to any parameter, any te uh, temperature settings that you desire. In this particular case, the factory default curve is 179 on the high side and 85 on the low side. Now, a typical installation around uh, is fin tube baseboard. Now, fin tube baseboard, we have to be very concerned of, uh, of the low water temperature being sent to it to make sure that we don't go b below the effective yield. We, yield. we, we have to uh, uh, hit a minimum temperature. Now, without knowing the, uh, the exact engineering of the home, well, we can just pick some round figures. We said fin tube baseboard. What is the lowest temperature that you would want to have delivered to your fin tube baseboard? Again, not knowing the engineering, maybe it's a retrofit. Well, we all know that once we start getting around that 120 mark, uh, if that system is even slightly under-radiated, we're not going to satisfy the thermostat, and that's going to result in a callback. So, me personally, I like to start at around 130 or 135. Uh, we can always go back and tweak it. Uh, but to do that, so we're not so concerned about the high temperature, that's already defaulted to 179, 180, that's what we want, but it's the low temperature we're concerned with. Now remember, in our quick access codes, we went into central heating and we set four parameters. One of those parameters was the lowest temperature on central heating. Now. In, in, in this case, that number now becomes very important because we're engaging outdoor strategy. So let's go back to that 426 setting. We can go through the quick access and we'll check what it is and we'll adjust it to the lowest temperature that we feel safe sending to. In this case, we mentioned fin tube baseboard. So I'm gonna enter into our quick access codes again by pressing my service buttons, go up to my 234, which unlocks the boiler control. Oops, 234. And now go to central heat and OK. And we went to function 426 was the last function. We hit OK. And that's 120. That's the factory default. Now, I said 130, 135. So let's adjust that to 130 or 135. There's 134, 135. Hit OK. At this point, let's go back to run. You're done. There's your outdoor reset done. So we've addressed the high temperature, 179, 180. That's correct. Our low temperature, the lowest we'll send to that fin tube baseboard in this particular application will be 135. That should uh, satisfy the thermostat on that 40 degree day. And uh, I just don't think it gets any easier than that. You can certainly go deeper into the weeds and you can really fine tune these and go into those individual menu items. But uh, to, to get it up and running doesn't get any easier. Okay, just wrapping things up. 
We've put our boiler back together. You've commissioned it. Let's make it look pretty for the customer, right? A little bit of cleaner and polisher in one. Get that thing all nice and shiny for your customer. It's a beautiful appliance. It's gonna run beautiful. Well, let's make it look beautiful and stay beautiful. Thank you very much for uh, staying with me today in uh, the remote located training trailer for Emerson Swan. Uh, thank you for taking the time to allow me to go through commissioning and setting up the control on our new HTP Ariston Elite Ultra Boiler. And uh, I look forward to bringing some more videos and please visit emersonswan.com for all the archived technical resources for you.